a little bit of color around um, why I invited Morgan, because oftentimes, like if I want to get to like the edge of what's happening in culture, I talk to Morgan. And these conversations uh, are like three hours long, and we're going to try to compress this into 30 minutes with some poignant questions. The anchors are uh, skateboarder surfer culture. And I do follow Morgan on Instagram, and you might have seen that we were chatting about surfing a little bit. Um, who is Stefan Wolfram? And I, I did meet uh, Morgan at South by Southwest, and we were talking a lot about uh, advertising and branding and uh, explored that a little bit. Whittle Schools and Studios and University for the Planet. So those are the anchors of uh, Morgan's bio that I put together, and he's going to connect the dots for us. Morgan? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Anthony. And uh, so nice to see everyone here. Um, I think it'll be even better if it's more conversational. So I'll try to just go through some of those things really quickly. Um, and, and as it relates to schooling and, and my own journey, the skateboarding and surfing subculture, I think it came from when I was really little. I, I loved school. And then like a lot of uh, adolescents, like started to rebel against authority and tried to find my own authentic culture and was growing up in Southern California and so a place where a lot of artists and people sort of expressing what they were thinking um, were in these sort of subcultures of skateboarding, uh, surfing, and, um, and, and that really resonated with me more than school. Um, and, I, and I kind of stopped doing a lot of school work um, and, uh, and, but I always felt like I was learning and exploring and that that was community driven. And I think that that's probably something we'll tap on as the, uh, the social aspect of learning, the fact that most learning happens socially and is socially constructed. Um, Stephen Wolfram is, uh, uh, I, I ended up doing well on my SATs and ended up going to college. Luckily, I was able to get into college, um, but also didn't really know what I was doing. And, 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 and I started to kind of like investigate these bigger questions behind that. So Stephen Wolfram is a mathematician. He builds a program called Mathematica. They, um, the, the, uh, actually, I bet a lot of your students might use uh, Wolfram Alpha as a way of sort of cheating on their math homework. I worked at his think tank, um, looking at the operating principles of, of nature, learning this advanced mathematics. And that's, that's what I ended up going back to school to study is complex systems. And I ended up working with Steve and starting a company that was really similar to Cambridge Analytica um, because we wanted to understand how culture operated and to see if there was a way of understanding people's interests beyond their demographics. But what are the things that people are interested in? What are the pathways for that interest with this idea that, um, that, that the depth of knowledge could be facilitated by knowing what sort of things you're attracted to and giving you sort of ways to begin in that space um, and then go deeper. Eventually, I, I worked at a place called Omnicom, which is a really big uh, media conglomerate. And so at Omnicom, we figured out how to bring uh, these sort of big brands like GE or Google, how they could reach new audiences on new platforms. And then lastly, uh, Whittle School and Studios. I was the chief product officer there for about four and a half years. And my, my job there was to understand what's happening at the edge of human learning and development and create a cohesive experience. We had a, a saying that curriculum was everything that a child experienced, meaning that learning uh, is something that's happening socially, it's happening in space. Um, how you greet and connect with a child is almost is equally as important as what it is that you're teaching. And, uh, and then actually the last thing that Anthony brought up that just to connect the dots, and I think you know, we can go into conversation is um, University for the Planet is what I'm starting to work on now, u4p.org. The idea is that we should start designing for human potential and planetary well-being. Um, and that's similar to the design thinking methodology that was really popularized by IDEO. And now there's this place called the D School at Stanford that, that has a design process around thinking through what the consumer, uh, what their consumer experience will be. Uh, this is about designing for what, do, what sort of potential do we all have latent within us with the idea that most of the products and services and systems that we're interacting with don't maximize our human potential. They're not thinking about how can this person learn, grow, contribute to a community, gain stronger community bonds, and that uh, figuring out how to do that and how to do that in conjunction with how the planet operates um, will, uh, is something that's necessary for us to 
um, further as a, as a society. So that's what U4P is doing. I, I try to research uh, Stephen Wolfram a little bit, and there's a, a lot of stuff around like computational thinking. So yeah. can you just describe a little bit more like what that actually is and why that's been important in your work? The most important thing with, um, with computational thinking or systems thinking, and this is Stephen's in this field, but as Anthony mentioned, a lot of people are in this space. You try to understand things by breaking them down into smaller and smaller pieces. So St Stephen has a book called A New Type of Science. And really the premise of that book is that sciences in the past have been, uh, have reduced things down to smaller components. So if you wanted to understand the brain, it'd be like, let's understand the neuron, the synapses, the protons, the electrons. Let's understand what they're doing chemically, physically, how they're, what, what, what the physics and chemistry behind each one of these things are. Um, and once you break down the, the brain into these smaller component parts, all of the things that are really interesting to us, like how are you learn? let's take the learning process, you know, what does learning look like? Um, what does emotion look like? Where do you store your memory? Any of these things, they're not answered by looking at their, by breaking it down into their reduced components. They're understood by creating a network of these things and understanding how they operate together and what the system dynamics are. Then if you think about organizations and organizational structures, we operate with these hierarchies. Uh, even when we build things, we build them uh, with these, uh, you know, usually using Euclidean geometries. You can kind of tell this is, you know, this is my smartphone. Um, you can kind of tell a man-made object when you see it. And the future is really more about understanding things programmatically. So this idea of uh, printing organs or, uh, or even horticulture and how you grow things organically. How can we take that process of organic growth that's been evolved over uh, you know, uh, a billion years? How can we start to apply those principles, understand those principles scientifically, and then build those principles, uh, build with those principles to, to create things that are more organic, whether that's a community structure or um, something that we're using. You talk about kind of the organic systems that um, you worked on through Stephen Wolfram, and it, it feels like like your career path was also organic. And in some ways, like I think the industry um, glamorizes you know, people that have had non-traditional career paths. They're like, oh, you know, this guy was X, and then now he's Y. And so I, I just love to hear a little bit around like how your career path has like got shaped. When we were b building Whittle School and Studios. We were thinking our, our school educated children ages three, you know, from nursery school until when you go to college. And there's this question like, if you're taking a three-year-old into your care and you have to educate them, you have to look at what does the world look like in 20 years, two decades from today when they're getting a job. And we, you know, there's a lot of reports. McKinsey has these reports. Uh, the government of Singapore has put together a really interesting report on the future of, of what work looks like. Truth is that no one totally knows, but it's the sort of incumbent responsibility of the school to think about what that world looks like. You think about what AI is so capable of. It's capable of replicating things in, in a known universe of, of, um, of actions. And I think that my career path has really been shaped by uh, these much bigger questions that I didn't know the answer to. And I think it's really important that whenever you're going into creating something for people, um, this idea that, that hopefully if it's, if it's really worth doing, it hasn't exactly been done before. And I'm not discrediting all the fields that make up uh, a body of knowledge that we're now operating at. We're, we're, uh, humanity has assembled so much knowledge around uh, psychology, uh, learning, uh, design, and, uh, and, and each one of those fields is so important, but I think that each, each one of the jobs I've had has started with a much bigger question. You know, we looked at what does a, what does a school look like? Um, what are all the things that can go into that? Uh, and, uh, and so we looked at ergonomics and design, and we worked with this architect, Peter Brown and Renzo Piano, and we brought them in. Um, we looked at uh, the science of learning. What do we know about uh, uh, the human brain and how it learns? And we worked with someone named Boris Saxberg and a woman, Lena Unkefer, from uh, UCSF and Stanford in the Applied Neuroscience Department. And so I think in each one of these fields, we began with a much, or for my career, it's always been shaped by a much bigger question. 
and, and, and a humbleness around the fact that we don't quite know yet. Uh, a sort of assessment of what is the ecosystem. So like what are the ecosystems of knowledge that can help us answer this question and trying to bridge those communities to help solve a really difficult question. You know, the glamorizing part, sometimes you're not successful. And I think it's really important to, to be okay with not being successful. Um, that's like a big part of the learning process. And I would say that a lot of my learning happened from the things that I wasn't really successful in. And I feel like now, or when you talk about your career, you focus on the successes so that people trust you and, and think that you're, you know, worth talking to. But I, I don't really find that those pieces were the, were, were where a lot of the, the most important lessons happened. When I was looking at Whittle, like, I, I think one of the things that they state pretty clearly is learning happens everywhere. You and I talked about was the, that podcast, uh, The Rabbit Hole. Oh, yeah. And as I was listening to that, I was just like dumbfounded by this whole other world that exists that I'm, I had, didn't grow up as part of. And really, I feel like I only used maybe less than 1% of the internet. And so that's where we're going to go in this part of the conversation. Today, in terms of daily views, Fox, MSNBC, and CNN only uh, equate to about 3 million views a day. The, the Wall Street Journal only has 3.5 million subscribers. And I'm using only because uh, YouTube has 2 billion subscribers. I'm talking about 2 billion compared to 3 million. Um, daily active viewers, active users is 30 million. 5 billion videos get watched every single day. 5 billion. And more than 1 billion hours of video get watched, gets watched every single day. And 1 billion hours is equivalent to 114,000 years a day. So when you think about that magnitude, and there's people like Joe Rogan, um, who has a podcast, a pop very popular podcast with 8 million subscribers alone, and 190 downloads, 190 million downloads a month. And so when we talk about learning happens everywhere, I think we often just ignore the internet. And I know that when I was uh, younger, I'm 50 now, but uh, when I was in school, uh, like 40 years ago, I, I was taught to use the library. Uh, I was taught to figure out what aisles to go to. And even when I was writing, I was taught to reference materials in different ways and look at diverse sources of materials in order to get different opinions. Yet in the use of the internet, which is kind of the majority of our lives these days, especially now with quarantine, right, where we're only on the internet, um, we have not taught students how to use the internet at all. And I all of a sudden like realized this week that I don't even know how to use the internet most of the time, right? Because there's a part of it that I haven't even accessed. What what have you guys thought about in terms of the the future students and the work you did at Whittle? Like how did you think about globalization and the internet as part of kind of the instructional strategy? We use this term and we use this term called VUCA, um, this idea that we live in a VUCA world, and that stands for volatile uncertain, uh, complex, and ambiguous. And we also had this, uh, this piece of the difference between uh, uh, noise and knowledge or uh, facts and wisdom. And what you're talking about is this you know, wild propagation of, of, of information um, that's available to anyone anywhere. And figuring out, you know, this, this podcast that you mentioned, this podcast rabbit hole, which uh, it's produced by the New York Times, but it's, it's really following the story of a lot of these communities that have massive numbers online um, and what that means for our society socially and politically. Uh, you know, how do you navigate something that's, that's new and unknown? Um, and how do you start to distinguish between, uh, between noise and knowledge? Uh, and and how do you make how do you make that knowledge go from facts to wisdom to something that, that you can that you can use? 
Um, and so we, we had digital literacy as a, it was, is a big part of the curriculum. You know, the, another thing that Rabbit Hole talks about is, are these algorithms and YouTube's algorithm, but what really the big change happened when YouTube changed their algorithm to be time spent on site. And once they changed their algorithm to be time spent on site, it started to recommend videos that people would spend hours with. How to start to combat the algorithm and to understand the algorithm, I think is a huge part of digital, digital literacy. Why are you being recommended this? What bubble are you living in? You always want to find a counterpoint to what it is that you, uh, uh, to what it is that you believe and, and really question it and question the facts and understand where the sources are. Those pieces are part of our digital literacy program. So part of it is, is, is this very forward thinking, what is the algorithm? Can you understand and decode the algorithm? But also some of these more traditional pieces of, of creating knowledge, like how do you create knowledge um, that come from you know, pre-internet days are still relevant today. You know, like what does this actually mean for educators? And I think you were scratching the surface a little bit, but I, I guess I feel like, you know, I, one, I was just surprised by the stats uh, of like uh, somebody watching video games, right? There's 104 million subscribers that this guy has where they're just watching him play video games, but it's beyond that. It's like three hours of commentary. Yeah. PewDiePie. And so when I think about education stu and to your point, students are learning everywhere, right? It's not just in the classroom and it's not just with the teacher. And so what role did you guys think about the teacher having when all of their like mental cognition is getting consumed in three hour chat sessions playing a video game? Like, how did you guys think about like, drawing their attention back into the curricula we we thought about it more as a as a process as opposed to a as opposed as opposed to like a mandate um and what i mean by that is uh we're asking our teachers to connect with these children who are growing up in a really different world this idea of like a VUCA world also means that that a lot of what we grew up in um, isn't what the children that we're trying to connect with, um, or actually really, I'd like, I don't even like the term children, like these younger people that we're trying to connect with, that they're growing up in. And I think that uh, we had a, a term that we weren't, that we were trying to shift from being a teacher to a Sherpa. And what we mean by a Sherpa is that there's a difference between feeling like you know the answer um, versus that you're going on a journey together. You know, so a Sherpa is along with this person who hasn't had the experience of summiting the mountain yet, but they're going along with you. They're not saying, oh, I've been there and describing out what the summit looks like and what, you know, what it took to get there. They're doing that along with the child and that there's a collaboration that's involved in that and, a, and, and sort of a, something that brings the teacher and the and the student together to, around a shared experience and I feel like understanding is step one um, and so you know you said that you went in a deep dive with PewDiePie so that you can understand what it is that's going on here it's really important to to do those deep dives um, and to have a, a degree of, of both empathy and shared knowledge to create those connections and then to point that younger person into a direction that you think will be productive for their development and growth. I'm wondering from your perspective, because you are the person I go to for the edge of culture, what are some of the things you think that um, educators today need to start thinking about so that uh, students are prepared a decade from now? Yeah, I, I, I think that this idea of no one can ever predict the future. Um, and there's, and there's two ways of looking at the world that we're currently in. Like even when we're speaking about YouTube and these numbers, which are you know, incredible, there's a way of looking at YouTube, which is, oh my God, it's this new, totally novel thing. There's another way of looking at it, which is what are the, what are the sort of base level programmatic things that we need as human beings to create a world for ourselves? And this idea of sharing knowledge, of connecting with one another in community, of contributing to something greater than yourself, these are things that are that have been with us from the very dawn of civilization and will be with us no matter what sort of future we create 
Um, and we are, the technology that we're using to, to do those things, that, that shifts. And that obviously creates like very different dynamics. But our way of looking at it are, what are the things that students need? What are the things that, that everyone needs to construct a learning environment? How does the human brain learn? What are the things that we need to connect? And then you can start to see the technology and all these other tools and including how people will connect in the future as shifting on, uh, on the methodology uh, of, of, of how it's created, but not really shifting on the fundamentals of what it's, of what it's doing. And I think, that, I think in that sense, we're relatively stable. Um, as in our, what we do as people hasn't really changed. It's more how we do it that changes. And so how do you look at the health and wellness of a child, which is necessary? Uh, we, we broke it up into three categories. We had uh, the world of self. And this means that there are practices that are necessary for dealing with this crazy world, including meditation, understanding how you learn, who you are, being able to communicate. The world of knowledge, which I think is what school is traditionally focused on, and that's skill sets, uh, enough to sort of scaffold so that you can have this lifelong learning and make sense of information and noise and everything else. Um, that's the world of knowledge. And then the last is the world of humanity. And that's how you tie yourself and knowledge to something greater than yourself, to a contribution in the world. Uh, and that working on all of those axes at the same time, those three axes at the same time, in the way that we construct school environments and thinking of the paradigms of what, what are the base level human needs and designing from that from that perspective. I think that that will always remain relevant. Dude, I'm gonna steal that because that was, that's the reason why we, I love talking to you because you're able to take kind of your system thinking and apply it to a complex set of conditions and then make it so simple for me to copy and tweet out. So thank <laughs> you so much for doing that. And I'm gonna, hand it over to uh, Drew, but please give Morgan a hand for allowing us to hear from him today.